virus doesn't travel six feet. This virus can go nine feet. This virus can go 25. This virus can go a mile. I've done the experiments. I've seen this in real world where we've done viruses. We've thrown them into a road and we can see the kinetic energy carry virus a mile, two miles down the road. Viruses do travel on air currents. So that mass is very important. Your air conditioning unit is very important. What happens when you get inside that facility? Are you testing your building? You can have all the protocols in the world, but if you cannot test your building to find out if it has COVID-19, we have the technology to make that happen. We can test your hospital and we can make guarantee you if your hospital is COVID-free 19 within, or SARS COVID-19 free within 90 minutes. That's high tech PCR technology. We have antiseptic hand wash to last 24 hours. We have the best surface disinfectant in the world called ProGuardium, developed by special forces, and we use it in Ebola infections. We use it in schools. We use it in nursing homes. It kills, it actually kills the SARS COVID virus. The stuff that you use at your hospital, I guarantee you, has not been tested like our stuff has been tested against the actual virus itself. And our stuff has been around since 1858. It's natural. Using your contact. We use it on fruits, vegetables. We use it, it kills gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, E. coli, salmonella, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, Ebola, SARS-CoV. <laughs> that is technology. Having temperature facial recognition cameras outside your hospital or outside or taking that temperature, not a person standing there with a gun because that person might be infected. You might infect that individual. Maybe the person is doing your testing with the gun is the asymptomatic area. So we have facial recognition cameras that you come up to four feet, it looks at you and go, doc, you have a fever. Doc, you don't have a fever. The door opens up, the door locks you out. This is what we call containment and mitigation. A lot of you folks don't realize to your question about what, how, what are the parameters, doc? Well, I guarantee you probably didn't know that the virus is on the bottom of your shoes. So you can have all the best protocols in the world. You can have COVID-19, E. coli, salmonella, all this influence on the bottom of your shoes. You go in your house or your hospital. You can track that in. So we have our security protocols is making sure people disinfect their shoes with our programming solution or what we have, our bio-decontamination unit. Understanding that. Understanding that your bathroom in your hospital might be the most contaminated place because you could have a patient that is asymptomatic. COVID-19, they use a the toilet, they flush that toilet, that virus gets earlized all over your bathroom, bottom of your shoes, et cetera. So these are the protocols that we're talking about that SRS has. We have the best technology on the planet based off of science and medicine. That is the reality. And our job, when, I, when we design these protocols and procedures, I think about the children that I've seen die. You're a doctor. My sister's the chief of OB at Baylor. Emergency room, OB, 30 years. She's seen it all. She's going through this stuff. She's going through what you're going through as an OB, ER, delivering people that are COVID, have COVID disease. And so the reality is that when we think about it, when we design our protocols, I think about everybody's children, everybody's grandchildren is my child. So I have to think of the protocols to make sure that I don't want to hear anybody crying or going to a funeral in our world. Dr. Lane, this is John Reed with the Center for African American Health. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining our community this evening and shedding light in an honest, straightforward way uh, around COVID-19 and the current pandemic that we're all experiencing, regardless of community, race, ethnicity, uh, where you live on the planet. Uh, it seems like everybody's impacted by it. As a representative from an organization that is really entrenched in the community and provides outreach and community-based services that complement um, our health delivery system, uh, one of my chief concerns is the ancillary impact that we're seeing on a daily basis 
uh, single moms that have children uh, that are increasingly without food, uh, that are being threatened with eviction, and, and really on the brink of homelessness. Um, as you so eloquently stated the facts, if you had um, 30 minutes with all the mayors, all the senators, all the folks from Congress, uh, and you had their ear, what would you say to them about uh, the societal ills that, that people are really beginning to feel? Uh, being laid off, being furloughed, uh, you know, just the level of volatility and uncertainty. What advice and what recommendations would you give them so that we can begin to provide some relief? And the other comment, it's not a question, is um, we deal a lot with bureaucracy you know, because we're not only providing relief, but we're providing programs. And, and there's a huge gap with our leadership in, in certain state-run bureaucracies catching up with this pandemic. They're still operating like we're, like we're in person, you know, and, and wanting community-based organizations to do things. So what kind of it could be scientific or practical advice would you give? And I know that's too long winded things. No, I don't, I don't think it's too long winded because what I've learned in life uh, and to your question, and I'm gonna give a, a real solid answer on that is that if I had the opportunity to talk to these folks, I would tell them you have to walk in other people's shoes. You have to have human compassion. And that's one thing I've learned working in the worlds that I've worked in in the jungles of Peru and Honduras, I've seen death, destruction. I wrote, I wrote and I presented at Tuskegee four years ago on healthcare disparities. I talked about the global impacts of diseases and you're absolutely correct. Global diseases, this pandemic has changed our society forever. I talked about, when I talked about Tuskegee at the seminar about diseases can cause the societies to collapse food insecurity, law insecurity, uh, hunger insecurity. We're talking about homeless security, societal security. People talk about their, their brother's keeper. No, they're not. It comes down to what we say, survival to fittest. An animal will try to survive, self-preservation. So what I would tell these folks is that if you have compassion for mankind, like I do and what SR S, SRS has, I tell my students, if your cup is running over with compassion, you can carry lots of people's crosses, but you have to be able to look through other people's eyes. That's what I've learned in my profession. And so I would tell people, you have to understand the woman that loses her home or the woman that has a child. The reason why we have to get back to what we really are as a human race is to be able to understand other people's pain. And that pain of other people, the suffering, becomes your gasoline to become a better person, to really pull up your fellow mankind. That's what I've learned. When I think about what we're doing, I think about the black children in Lexington, Mississippi, 3,000 of them. They get their food from school. Folks, they get their food from school, they're so poor. If they don't go to school, they don't eat. That is heartbreaking to be in a modern society like we are versus a third world country like Peru, South America, et cetera. And we have this such this politics polarization in it. You know, I'm, you know, you're talking about advocacy. I'm also on the HIV COVID healthcare task force for the nation. So I understand people, I understand diseases, I understand compassion. So what I would tell folks is that if you are a real human being, whatever God you believe in, if you really have compassion for your fellow man mankind, you would do what you have to do and do the right thing because your soul and your body tells you to do that and you sleep good at night. Well, thank you for answering that question. And uh, this is a yes or no question. Okay. Um, 
do you think a requisite for returning to work or having students and teachers go to school should be you have to have a COVID test? No. The, my question be that is that it's impossible to do that. The, the basic recommendation that we will make at SRS is that is your facility been tested for COVID-19? If your facility has been tested for COVID-19 and that building comes back to COVID-19 compliant then people and uh, teachers and students can go back to school. That's what we're doing in North Carolina. This is not theoretical. We're making it happen because the virus doesn't just jump up and get there by itself. The virus is carried by individuals. So once we secure that building and people follow our biosecurity protocols, we almost guarantee you're not gonna get the virus and people can function in that environment. I think I'm up next. Thank you very much, Dr. Roland. Thank you so Thank much. You. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, and uh, so now we're gonna move to uh, Dr. Angie Pacioni. Yeah. Um, Angie, please. Yes, thank you. Right. And um, boy, Dr. Rowling, I, I don't know if I should just be shaking in my boots or if I should put on a hazmat suit. I mean, you got me, uh, I'm a little nervous about this now. <laughs> my, my responsibility, I, I represent, the, of course, the governor and the Department of Higher Education, not K-12. And so we have lots of buildings, lots of, um, you know, on our campuses. And the higher ed budget is, has taken a hit over the last two decades. And so um, what this is revealing is the inherent inequity of our school systems, of our college systems. And so we have, we've got rural colleges, community colleges and four-year comprehensive colleges that simply do not have the budget to do the kind of, um, of uh, precautions that you are, we can't buy the cube. It looks fantastic, but I don't think we are barely trying to get testing done and PPE in some of these institutions. And so what should I tell my, uh, the presidents of the institutions of Colorado? You know, we are we're just a couple weeks away from bringing thousands of students back to campuses. Um, and um, is that the right thing to do? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the truth. Because like you say, you know, the truth will, is, is the way it needs to be. My recommendation for you, uh, Doc, is that you're right. You cannot afford to test every student. You cannot afford to do a lot of things, but you can afford SRS. Because the most important test for containment and mitigation, the way we're going to go in the future, is to be able to test your buildings. About we test your buildings, we can tell you within 90 minutes if that building is COVID-19 free. Once that building is COVID-19 free, we can implement biosafety protocols. I'm talking about students. You got to wear a mask. You got to wash your hands, mm -hmm. not with soap, but with antiseptic hand wash that actually lasts 24 hours and kills viruses and stuff. Do we, we have, have to test do we have to test the buildings every day? Like do no. we No, no, you don't. You do not have to test the building every day. You might have to test that building, you know, once a month, maybe once every two weeks. As long as that you have containment and mitigation, you have control. We have a thing we call Aetna, early detection necessary action. Let me repeat it again, Aetna, early detection necessary action. We don't wait for the virus to come. We're on the offense, like we say in the military. We go look for the enemy. We, di we dictate the grounds. We dictate the environment. If you control the environment, you control the, the virus. So once we secure your building, we test it. You you'll know in 90 minutes, Dr. Rowan, your building is COVID-19 free. That's great. Let's make sure we set up the protocols. Hey, folks, you go in the building, you have to spray the bottom of your shoes. Well, you don't have to have a $30,000, $40,000 bio decontamination unit. We have what we call mini, we have mini bio decontamination units where people can spray themselves. You can spray the bottom of your shoes, $15, $30. I mean, that's very cheap for what you're going to spend because you have to get your, your students back into 
the society. We have to get to this new norm. This is going to be the new norm. Uh, and this is important for you as an educator. You know that there are kids that have food insecurity. We know that there are kids out there that are sexually abused. We know that there are kids that are in you know, dysfunctional homes where there's abusive. And the school, your responsibility, you develop people like me. And I have to have that safe environment to be able to function in so we can do that. So if you go down this road, you will have to work with us to say this building has been tested. This building is COVID free. Students, this is what you have to do to go back in this environment. One, wash your hands, mask, temperature check, making sure that your bathroom has our Pro Guardian solution that actually kills SARS COVID. It's a natural product because you can't continue to expose people to Lysol. People don't realize that Lysol is an EPA product. It's called, it's a pesticide. Our stuff is not a pesticide. Chlorine, bleach, causes lung cancer over continual exposure. Ours is a natural. So we save you money by having what we call the best surface disinfectant in the world. We can do that for you, uh, doctor. So your question is that you save money because your students are in a protective environment and they're back in school knowing and the parents know that, man, hey, doctor and guys have a biosafety protocol that my kids can go to school, I can go to work in peace and understanding what's going on, Doc. Thank you. That's perfect. I think I'm kind of with you there, Angie. I, I don't think I ever want to go outside again. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but this, is, this is just uh, terrific. I think that it's exactly what we need. We need some solutions. Um, and I think this is terrific. Um, so I see that uh, Rich Lewis has joined us. Rich, uh, can you hear me? Rich, I can hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Please, yeah, go right ahead with your question or comment. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Doctor, uh, for your passion and insights and knowledge in this space. It's been, been very enlightening uh, watching you. I have a couple questions. One you've kind of already answered. Uh, so my, my other question would be, you know, when I think of, 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 of diseases like uh, Ebola that came up earlier that, uh, you know, from what I recall is more infectious and more lethal than, and correct me if I'm wrong, but more infectious and more lethal than COVID-19, um, I, I often wonder how that disease was stopped so, uh, so quickly and didn't really impact, you know, us here in the United States. And why COVID-19 has, has, has proliferated so, so rapidly. And the second question is, you know, we're so focused on COVID-19 right now. Um, if, if we don't know what the difference between how we stopped Ebola and why COVID is running so hard, you know, how can we be sure that there's not something else coming on the heels of COVID-19, you know, next year, next month, uh, 10 years from now? Well, your first question is that, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a uh, pathogenic virologist and a bioweapons chemical expert, you're, you're the <laughs> Ebola is a R naught number of one. Coronavirus is an R naught number of 3.5 to up to 10. Coronavirus is much more infectious than uh, Ebola would ever be. If you get Ebola, you have a 90 chance of dying from it, it will kill you. And the reason why is that Ebola is a blood transmission disease, one to one. You have to get in contact with the blood. Coronavirus, measles, these are airborne viruses, airborne transmission. Somebody coughs, you get the disease. Also with coronavirus, you can do fecal transmission. Even also with uh, Ebola, it's a one to one, uh, you know, one to one, uh, one person gets Ebola, they affect one person. Coronavirus gets it, it affects 4.53 up to 10. Measles can affect 12 people. So that is uh, the reality and space of science and medicine. And the reason why it was contained, it, it's demographic, it's, it's origin, it's Africa. You know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be airborne. Uh, a person would have to get on a plane with Ebola, get to America, and then have a massive outbreak of that disease 
through blood and all that stuff. So that for that to be transmitted is very, very remote. Coronavirus has a, a different ball game on that. So coronavirus is much more infectious. Now to your question about what's coming down the pipe, absolutely. Evolution tells you that. Right now, there's a new swine flu in China. Pigs are dying. So we're going to be seeing another big jump in viral transmission in the fall. Is there going to be something 10 years from now? Absolutely. This is the way evolution is. If we look at the last 30 years, 2002 was SARS number one. 2010, 12 was MERS. This is 10 years later. We got SARS COVID number two. And it maybe in 10 years, there'll be another virus that's going to jump. If you read the literature and the science, there's a virus in Pakistan right now that are killing lots and lots of people. And they're trying to figure out what virus that's, that is. So that virus might jump into our society. That's scary. And then if I may just tack on one more, you've already kind of answered this question, but if, if there's anything else you'd like to add, please, please do so. Uh, you know, I'm a business guy. I, I have a business. I have employees. We've been working from home. Uh, for the most part, you know, people are okay from home, but at some point we are going to need to go back to the office, even if just uh, on occasion. What are we going to need to do to really open up the offices and move people in? You've kind of already answered this with, uh, you know, basically inspecting the buildings and uh, and masks and some of the other procedures and and, and that you've kind of pointed out, uh, uh, which does not include washing your hands with soap and water. I got that. <laughs> but uh, is there anything else that we should uh, keep in mind as we, you know, even attempt to think about opening uh, our offices again? I think I think probably the most important thing as businesses. Uh, hotels, uh, McDonald's, uh, schools, any place where people congregate could be your, your tax office, it could be the mayor's office. We have to be able to test the facility. If you test facility, Fauci said the same thing. You're going to see what I'm talking about when, when the next time Fauci gets on, but Fauci says the same thing I'm saying. You have to test the facility. That is because the, the facility can be the vector. It can be the, the origin of the infection because the virus can live in feces, somebody could spit, somebody could uh, have it on the bottom of their shoes. So you have to test the facility and make sure that that building or your office is COVID-19 free. If that building is COVID-19 free, then you have the ability and insurance to allow people, students to go back into that environment if you have the right biosafety and biosecurity protocols. That's just the way it is and stuff. This is the future. This is how it has to be. You can have all the protocols in the world. You can come back at the University of Colorado. You can come back to the high school in Denver, uh, Grand Rapids, whatever the case is, businesses, whatever. If you do not test that facility, people can get infected. So that is the key. That is your frontline defense because you cannot test every individual. It's, it's, it's impossible. The, the sensitivity is wrong. You can miss asymptomatic people. That's happening now. Asymptomatic people don't get the test. So the reality is that you have your front line, the instrument for everybody in the world to get back to being the new norm is you have to test that facility to make sure it's COVID-19, excuse me, SARS COVID free. And once we do that, we put the seal on that, that you're COVID-19 secure. Dr. Rowling, you know, the schools have been empty. The colleges have been pretty much empty for such a long time. Could it, could the, the virus still be active? I mean, there hasn't been anybody in some of these classrooms for months. And so and you, we, you're, probably, yeah. you're, you're, you're probably absolutely right. But we also found that when we did some tests in North Carolina, uh, we found uh, COVID-19 on a vacuum cleaner in one of the schools. I want to let people know, listen to me very carefully, because I'm the expert, period. That's just a fact. The very first case in Germany was in Bavaria. One of the workers, German automotive plant. They have a lot of Chinese people that work for the German automotive plant. The guy came from China, went to the cafeteria, sitting across from a German. He said, please pass me the salt shaker. That salt shaker started the epidemic in Germany, a salt shaker. So doctor, to your question, every building has to be tested when you start having 
human beings in it. But once you understand that the building has been tested, it's COVID-19 uh, negative, then you implement your biosafety protocols. Hey guys, we're gonna have facial recognition to tell students to have a temperature. Guys, this is how you're gonna wash your hands. This is what you're gonna use. We're gonna certify your, your janitorial people on cleaning that building using our certification, CDC, OSHA, to protect you, your staff, and their family members based off of our protocols that we've established at SRS, based off of science and medicine. You do that, doc, I feel quite comfortable that your students can go back to school and we can make it happen. And I would love to have the opportunity like I'm doing uh, Monday for North Carolina. I'm doing a, a, a webinar for the whole entire school district, teachers and everybody talking about COVID-19, how you move into the future, how do you protect yourself and your family? Dr. Rowling, Ralph Simpson here. Hey, how you doing, Ralph? I'm doing good, <laughs> Dr. Rowling. Dr. Rowling, um, you've been on our show several times. I'm getting a ton of calls asking, when is the home program going to roll out? And, and, and can you explain that program? Well, I'm going to if uh, I'm going to let the CEO, uh, Charles Pickett. Can you uh, let Charles Pickett talk about that, please? Hello. How are you guys okay. doing? <laughs> Go for it. Dr. Tom, you your shirt shine now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, the home program, uh, Ralph, and it's, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, it, it'll launch on Monday. Uh, it'll consist of a pro guardian to uh, uh, hand sanitizer, a 24 hour hand sanitizer. Uh, it also have a travel kit that uh, you can take to the airport wherever we have a small mister and, and a small hand, hand sanitizer. And uh, some of them will have mats and they go on up from there. But Monday. Mr. Pickett, I want you to, can you talk to, uh, can you educate everybody about SRS, the company history, our work with pan, pandemic disasters, what I call affected people around the world. Tell people who we are, what you are, and why we're the company on the planet saving people's lives. Well, I'm CEO of SRS Incorporated. It's a 19-year-old business. Uh, we've done over 300 contracts with the federal government with 15 different agencies. Uh, we built schools, stadiums, uh, been on hospital projects, and we do a lot of disaster relief. We've been doing that disaster relief, relief the entire 19 years. <clears throat> We're involved uh, now in this virus because we think we have a, a solution, a system, uh, and that's what we stand for, system-ready solutions. Uh, that will enable us to, you know, get back to some kind of normalcy. Uh, I'm a physicist. Uh, my education is in physics. Uh, I'm also a former school administrator and, and uh, principal. Uh, so <clears throat> I have a, a real strong feeling for kids and, and, and their ability to function in our society. And I'll say two things, guys, about getting back to school. <clears throat> You know, viruses wreak on havoc and chaos. And, you know, they're, they're strongest when they're not in a controlled environment. I think it's critical that we, we put together as many controlled environments as we can to fight this virus. Uh, and that's <clears throat> based on science and medicine. But more importantly, a little common sense. You know, we, we, uh, we closed schools down in March. And, you know, with the premise that 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 Americans would be like the people in communist countries and they would just stop going out and doing what they normally do. And that's just not going to ever be the case. But we let school out in March during a time where people can go outside and, and, and amongst fresh air. And, and that virus wreaked havoc on us. You know, so <clears throat> I can only imagine what's going to happen in, I'm in Jackson, Mississippi, where uh, 
the majority of the population is socially disadvantaged and you got kids just running around the communities with that virus wreaking havoc, uh, you know, and then they're, they're going to be getting together in buildings that are not sufficiently uh, purified with air, you know. What, so I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm really concerned that, that uh, you know, there's some reverse politics here or whatever, but, you know, common sense and science, you know, says that we have to have as many controlled environments as we can provide uh, to fight this virus. And, and we just the history, short history, since March, we have been just killed by this virus during a time that they said that it, that it should be, it be letting off. Uh, but SRS is here to, to, to uh, move it, move this, move the country in the right direction or be a part of it, uh, part of the solution, not the problem. And I, I can tell you, I'm, I'm really impressed with, uh, the people in that state, in your state. Uh, the Simpsons brought us down, uh, Shelly and, and Ralph, and, and their compassion for people is, is remarkable. Uh, we ran into Mike Watson and, and Gabe Lindsay, who were trying to have Little League football, and their passion was the same. And now on the phone with you guys, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. You, uh, yeah. So who's that with a question? Go ahead. I, I'm going to let you go ahead. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, we have crossed the eight o'clock hour. Looks like we're at about 20 minutes, so we certainly want to be respectful of everybody's time. May I have one yeah, brief uh, question from Japan? Is that uh, Malcolm? Malcolm, go right ahead. Pose your question. Yes, sir. Before we go, before we go to the chat. Thank room. you very much. Thank you very much for allowing me. Not... All right. Thank you very much. For for the opportunity. Uh, let me remove my mask. I'm actually hospitalized for a mild stroke and I'm still working here. I can tell you about protocols the Japanese have in, uh, about Dr. Rowling's procedures having seen him on my previous broadcast. Two questions. One about the politicization of protocols during this election year when we have a guy in the White House who's talking about it is what it is, and then putting Dr. Fauci's comments and other people at the CDC and NHI in jeopardy as to, as a journalist, I'm all about public information and truth and reporting. If the good doctor can speak to that, I know he gives the so-so version, the Mickey Mouse version to those who want to hear it, but he's often given the Dr. Rowling version, and that's what I want to hear now, so that I can disseminate this information to my listeners and viewers here in Japan who are, uh, by the way, he's trending in Asia with his information. And people are looking for viable, credible sources of information to deal with this pandemic. Doctor, if you will speak on that for one minute, and I have a follow-up question after that, please. Well, to your, to your question about that, you're, you're absolutely right about the politics. Uh, and one thing that I, I don't want to get into politics, I don't conspiracy theories, I deal with science and medicine, and that's the way I'm going to continue to do that. My recommendation would be if uh, if you have loved ones, you have family members, you have access to people that are in the politics, you know, they need to hear our message about the truth about this disease and stuff like that. And that's just the way it is. You know, uh, it's just keeping it straight, forward, concise, based off of science. Thank you. Appreciate it very much, Doctor. And uh, the follow-up is that I was with a doctor from Kyoto University who is a candidate as a Nobel laureate who actually saw your interview and was asking me about how best he can access information uh, regarding your uh, prescribed uh, protocols for facilitation, safety, buildings, schools, hospitals, etc. How well, which, can we get they, that information? Sure. They can get that information by call, by contacting SRS or SRSINCORP.com, our website. Contact that or contact our CEO, Charles Pickett, and we can get the information about safety and biosecurity protocols that we've already designed. They're ready to go. And I also know that. Uh, Thank you very B much, Dr. I appreciate it. Thank you, Malcolm. I, I also know that B has placed that contact information uh, for Dr. Rowling on, in the chat room, which is www.tsr.org. Thank you. 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 Thank
P A I D A dot org. Again, that's T A T P A I D. Uh, wait a minute. Let me do that again. T P A I D A dot org. Uh, so yeah, just but, in the but, chat room. But, uh, but for the, yeah, but for the biosafety and security protocols, they have to go to S R S I and then uh, uh, Charles Pickett will be able to get that to the information to everybody out there. That's okay. correct. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let's, now let's go to the chat room. We've got a few questions. Uh, we've got a question from Lakeisha Marie Locke. Uh, I'm not sure if Lakeisha is still on, but she wanted to know, beyond the basic things that we've, we've heard, wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands, are there other, she, she wants to know five other things that we might be able to do to keep ourselves safe. Well, I mean, well, the, the common sense is one is make sure that you, you know, that you understand situational awareness. You need to understand in a Walmart uh, uh, that a mask is very important. If you're out in a park by yourself, a mask is not important. Making sure you, uh, you know, uh, make sure you go to your home. Do not wear your shoes in your house. Making sure that you have the best surface expected to be able to stir back or spray down your packages. Uh, we have that FRS, and it's called ProGuardian. You know, making sure that you have the best air filtration units in your house, in your in your in, in your house, like uh, have these air filtration, you know, SARS-CoV, other RNA viruses that are airborne. Making sure that you you understand that this virus is not going anywhere. Making sure you're exchanging money money at the store. Uh, getting dollars versus versus your making sure that you're using the right, you know, disinfectant for that. Making sure that you uh, understand that if you're flying on the airplane, making sure you have uh, the best mask that you can possibly get that I use to travel when I fly. So make sure you have that. These are some of the, the common stuff that you can use. Uh, and these are basic just uh, the rules. These are the Part of your biosafety protocols. If you get a fever uh, and, and you and you have a sore throat or you lose your smell, get into the system. Make sure they test you. Make sure they don't send you home to self quarantine because you can end up dying. Make sure you demand the healthcare that you deserve. This is what you pay your money for. Our next question is from uh, Derek Presley. And Derek, um, and I know that you, talk, you talked a bit about this, uh, Dr. Rowling. Uh, he wants to know how many times is this thing mutated? And I know that you've answered that. But, but his second follow-up question is, when you say waves, what, what are you referring to? Well, I mean, we call it waves or we call it stages when we look at, at pandemics. When we really get down to it, it's, it's, really, it's more than three waves of what we call. Well, the first wave is usually about 25% of the population. So we look at America. We're at t we have 5 million people infected. Guess what? We're going to have to have 25% of 360 million Americans have to be affected to get to the first wave. When that gets done, we get into the second wave, which is about 50% of the population. So 50% of 360 million tells you how many people got to get infected. And then we have the precursory part of the, of the pandemic, which would be 25% of the population. What he's looking for is that word that everybody's been talking about, herd immunity. Herd immunity means that you get 70% of the population is infected and they have supposedly have antibodies. They've been infected, the people survive. And then what happens, they can go back to work. And the other 25% of the people that have been quarantined that have not been exposed to the virus will eventually get to the virus and stuff. So that's what we mean by, by waves. First wave, 25%. Second wave, 50%. Third wave, 25%. Then what you have is what we call herd immunity, and everybody's been exposed to the virus. Wow. Wow. Our next question is from Dr. Libby Brown. And uh, her question is, how can you explain this virus to children without scaring them? Well, we have, we, what we've done at uh, SRS, we came up with a character called Uncle Kuski. He's like your uncle. He's a dapper. We have a cartoon uh, uh, comic book where he teaches kids how to wash their hands. And what I've done, uh, it, uh, what I've done was about six weeks ago, we created Uncle Kusi because 
I was thinking that, God, we're talking, to, everybody's talking about adults, CNN, Fox, everybody, but nobody's talking about children and children are being affected with this disease, not by just only the, 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 the disease itself, but also the fact that they're not going to school. They have a different norm. So we have to be able to have town halls for children. I call it a town hall fireside with Dr. Chocolate to talk to the children, <laughs> talk to their level and explain to them what's happening. And they can ask the questions because they're the ones that are our future generation. They're the ones that are, that are, that are, that are infected and stuff. And I want to, uh, I want Charles Pickett to tune in on this. Uh, 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 Mr. Pickett, in your experience as a, a superintendent and principal, what have you always said about the schools and the environment for kids, the safety of that? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I honestly believe that the school is the safest place for them uh, and, and can be made safe for them. Okay. <clears throat> we have a question from uh, Ramelda, uh, who is a school administrator from the Bahamas, who's chiming in with us tonight. And her concern is how do we control the protocols being followed by the very young students? So you're talking about the kindergarten, first graders. Well, it's the same thing. You, 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 you have to sit down and you have to talk their lingo, you know, and that's, you have to talk everybody's language. When I'm, when I'm with my Hispanic folks or my Spanish patients, I speak Looks like we may have uh, lost the connection with Dr. Bullen. Uh, hopefully he'll come back in. Let me, you won't um, that question though. You know, uh, basically when, when you're dealing with these, this virus, you got to deal with the entry point. And you know, you can, you can put kids in a position where they don't have a chance to break the protocol. You know, so at that entry point, if their temperatures check correctly uh, and the next step they make is cross a disinfected mat that cleans their feet. Somebody's sitting there making them put 24 hour hand sanitizer on rather than regular hand sanitizer. If they don't wash their hands uh, anymore, or put in more on that, that sanitizer continues to kill. Uh, they walk through a decontamination unit or get decontaminated. And then they're in an environment that's already proven to be COVID free. You're not really asking a lot out of, uh, don't, from there, they just need to make sure to keep them those masks on. Thank you very much for that, Charles. We appreciate you jumping in there. And while we're waiting for Dr. Rowling to come back in, uh, B has listed the contact information for everyone. Uh, SRS Incorp, SRSIncorp.com uh, is how you reach out to this, this fine, fine organization. Um, so uh, I'm not sure whether we can just kind of continue. We've got about eight minutes left uh, for our program tonight. And we wanted to give an opportunity for those of you guys who are actually in the chat right now or in, in the meeting right now live uh, to pose a question if you have one. Does anybody have a question? And uh, if not, we can go on. Yes. Hold on. Her name is... Dr. Monica Larson. I see that. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I had a couple questions, actually. Uh, good evening, and thanks for having this. This discussion is very relevant and necessary. Um, one is um, earlier he brought up, um, Dr. Rowland brought up about, um, I'm thinking in uh, regard to this in school, about tests, because he said, uh, he wouldn't recommend an individual who's sitting there with a thermometer in the event that they are right. infected. What type of, how would you do that? What would you recommend? Well, what I would recommend, what I would recommend is the temperature facial recognition uh, tab is tab. We've already implemented these in North Carolina, Mississippi, Texas, uh, different universities and stuff and businesses. This temperature facial tablet is a standalone. We can put it inside the building. We can put it on outside the building where you can be four feet and it better your temperature. Up and we can have it hooked up to the network. Uh, Charles Pickett, uh, about that more, please. 
Couldn't hear you, Doc. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now about the, uh, yeah. the temperature? Yes, and there are several models. You know, there, there are standard uh, instruments you can use to take the temperature. You know, the, that person that's holding that wand out there is susceptible to not just COVID, flu, and everything else that kids give us uh, along the way. Uh, it's better than nothing, but not near as good as having a standalone uh, piece of equipment that accurately take that temperature. Okay. Um, thank you. I had two quick other questions. Do you recommend a specific mask in particular that's more effective than others? Because I've seen a different things on people and people not properly wearing them and such. I just don't even want to go out of the house. And then second, <laughs> do you have like um, regarding the testing, because um, we hear a lot about the false negative, how reliable well, I mean, at, at the at, on the mask uh, situation, my recommendation is that you try to get the mask uh, in, in 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 the environment. And for example, when I'm playing, I'm wearing the I'm wearing the best mask that I can possibly have, and that's a three M seven five zero zero mask. It has an air filter, look like I'm uh, Star Wars. Versus what public. You know, if I'm going to uh, to get my car wash, I just wear a regular cloth mask, which is any mask that you can use to decrease the amount of virus load, be it a cloth mask or an N95 surgical mask, or even one of our high tech masks, is a frontline situation. You know, on your question on antibody testing, you're absolutely correct. There's such a discrepancy in the testing units from Abbott to all these different companies because these guys did not get the or, or did not get or had the ability to get all the different trains inside their pits and stuff. But the best reliable way is what we call the ECR testing and we have that capability. In fact, SRS also has not just antibody testing for buildings, we also have antibody testing for people. We were the people that tested Kevin Durant and some of the NBA players. And our testing, we can determine and tell you within 10 minutes if you've been positive for COVID-19, excuse me, SARS-CoV-2, or been exposed. 10 minutes, folks. And that's a fingerprint. And we take your blood, not putting it in your nose and sending it to some testing thing. And it takes anywhere from two days, three days, six weeks. We can tell you within 10 minutes if you are affected with COVID-19 or sars cov and also we can test your building. We have the latest technology to make that happen, folks. Let's take uh, two final questions as we begin to wrap up. I see that there's a question by Tony Pacioni, uh, and he wants to know, how can we protect ourselves from these mutated versions? Well, the way you protect yourself from mutation versions, like you protect you anything, you have great base, basic biosafety and biosecurity protocols. If you control the environment, early detection, necessary action, you understand what you're dealing with, doesn't matter. The mask is going to protect you if it's, if it's mutated 100 strain, uh, number 105. Uh, wash your hands with the best antiseptic hand wash and uh, hand sanitizer that we have will protect yourself. Making sure that you don't wear your shoes in your house. These is the same basic principles that we use in the world of infectious disease and biological warfare. Thank you very much. And finally, um, there's a question. Uh, how, how might we, and this is coming from Derek uh, Presley again, uh, how might we secure more testing? How do you say, say that again? How do you hear uh, that part? His question is, how might we secure more testing? Well, the testing is going to be almost impossible because of the, 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 the lag of lack of swabs, the chemicals, what testing, different platforms. Uh, so our philosophy is that because of the, 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 the amount of manpower, the lack of supplies, the best way to test a population is to be able to test that building, test that facility, have temperature facial recognition that can 
to take people's temperature. That helps with containment and mitigation. Mm -hmm. That controls the environment. You know, you put a you put a temperature facial recognition in front of a school uh, or in a in a church, and people come there, and there's a spike in temperature. That lets us know that something's going on. So we can contain, we can mitigate the infection in that population because the testing everybody, folks, I am sorry, that is not going to happen. Because if you start talking about testing people, the test is not one time. You would have to test people weekly, every week, four, four times a month. Can you imagine 360 million people getting tests? It's not going to happen, folks. Can I, can I jump in here and say one thing? I think that there is something from the perspective of our community that we have to do because I, I candidly am not ready to rule out the importance of testing. We all need to urge our Congress folks, our congressional delegation, to urge the president or whomever to pass the Defense Production Act. There are ways that and, and get um, the companies producing the equipment that would allow for testing. This is it's absurd what's happening in our country right now around not only the variability in testing, even those tests that are, are good from the perspective, as good as we have right now from the perspective of reliability, when you've got the kind of variations in terms of getting test results back because of all sorts of shortages, including the ability even in the labs to process the test, this is, this is, an, this is a national shame. It's a national embarrassment. It should not be happening. Other countries have figured out how to do this. And frankly, um, I'm not sure that we have even the total capacity. If you think of the number, you know, respectfully, mix it up a little bit here, Dr. Rowling. Um, respectfully, the number of buildings that would need to, quote, be secured, I'm not sure we have the manpower to even do that. We've got to have widespread availability of testing, and it, is, and it has been done in countries with far more people than we do. Remember, we're 5% of the world's population and we're 25% of the of the positive tests, let alone 25% or so of the deaths. So to, to rule out or just to discard the importance of testing in this, I think is not necessarily um, thinking about all the beachfronts on which we're going to have to fight this thing in the coming, frankly, years. Yeah, we, we do have a you. new test up at CU, CU Boulder, the uh, health systems, they um, develop a new saliva test that has instant results. You spit into a tube. And so we're looking at how do we scale that. So that might, it's a new innovation that, that has just come out just in the last couple of weeks. And um, we are looking to really scale that across the state of Colorado if it works as well as we think it does. So, so I, think there's, I think that there's the, there, there is the prevention part of this, which is, as I've said, is not sexy. It's masking. It's washing your hands. And actually, I love what you said, because all washing your hands does is wash the germs down the, or the virus down the, the, the drain. You have to use um, appropriate disinfectants to make that work. And really, the social distancing, which is, is not trivial, these big spreads that are happening, and it's really these 20 to 40-year-olds who are out doing this who are not willing to sort of slow their roll for a few weeks to allow us to get this damn thing under control, <clears throat> part of my French. Um, you know, Kelly Anderson is uh, waiting actually, on city officials. Let me, to let me say this back to her. The testing is very important, but we have to keep it keep it real. And when we talk about testing, the testing would have to be uniform across every person in America because you always have patients or people that are asymptomatic, and that is the most dangerous part: is the asymptomatic patient that doesn't have uh, they are the super spreader of the disease and stuff. So if we were talking about testing, and I agree with you 150%, we're America. We're supposed to be the greatest country on the planet on our testing. We have drones. We have all types of technology, and we can't figure out testing. But if you go testing, testing has to be done on every person in America or the world because that individual can become the super spreader. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, listen, we are we are be we are beyond our time, but there's one one last question, Dr. Rowley, and that is from uh, Patricia Jones Blessman. Southwest Airlines just announced that they are not no longer cleaning seat belts and armrests. They also claim that they have a disinfectant spray that forms an antimicrobial coating that kills viruses on contact for 30 days. Have you heard of this? And is there any truth to that? Uh, in my opinion, I have some land 
in Colorado that I can sell you for two Oreo cookies. I'll take that. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. That, that's a nice and concise answer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I just want to thank Dr. Rowling for this extremely valuable information and your valuable time. I don't know how you do it. We've talked to you several times. You've always been phenomenal. The information is always stellar. And I, I don't know how you're holding up, but we're certainly glad that you are. So we want to also thank our panelists tonight, uh, Mr. John Reed. Uh, Dr. Angie Pacioni, uh, Richard Lewis, Charles Pickett, uh, Dr. Alan Davis, and Dr. Johnny Johnson. Guys, thank you so very much. Uh, we could clearly go on for several more hours, but uh, we, are past our, we are past our time, and I think uh, we should probably cut it off here. So again, uh, with that, thank you again, everybody. And I understand that, uh, that uh, Ralph Simpson and, uh, and his folks are uh, are responsible for bringing Dr. Dr. Rowland. So Ralph, uh, thank you so much, you and your team. And again, everybody, um, let's stay safe. Thank you everybody. And I wanna say everybody, I look forward to meeting you guys and God bless you guys. And uh, hey, you know, we got a long ways to go and I look forward to doing part two, maybe in October, November, because it's gonna be reality time for a lot of folks. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks everybody. Be well everybody. Hey. Be safe. Okay. Have a good night. Okay. Good night, everybody from Japan. Okay. Bye-bye.